Turn with me, if you would, now to Joshua chapter 6. Uh, we are under a little bit of a time constraint, so if I do a Steve Lawson um, and speak without pausing, uh, that's the reason. Uh, this is not um, a topic that I would have chosen. I mean that sincerely. Uh, this is a topic you speak on because you believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, this, is a, this is a solemn, heart-rending topic. We are going to talk about the killing of men and women and children and babies. These are the passages in Scripture which make some people believe that the Bible cannot possibly be the inerrant Word of God. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 6. I'm going to read the passage fairly quickly. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up everyone straight before him. So Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass on before the ark of the Lord. And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the ark of the covenant of the Lord following them. The armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the ark while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded the people, you shall not shout or make your voice heard, neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout, then you shall shout. So he caused the ark of the Lord to circle the city, going about it once, and they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and priests took up the ark of the Lord, and the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord walked on, and they blew the trumpets continually. And the armed men were walking before them, and the rear guard was walking after the ark of the Lord while the trumpets blew continually. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned into the camp, so they did for six days. On the seventh day they rose early at the dawn of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. 
And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction. Both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys with the edge of the sword. And then there follows the account of the rescue of Rahab. This narrative falls into four aspects. First of all, the encounter at the end of chapter 5 of Joshua with the captain of the Lord's army, this mysterious figure. And remember, he has a sword in his hand. And Joshua asks him, are you with us or against us? And then in verse 2 of chapter 6, and the Lord, capital letters, the covenant name of God, and the Lord said to Joshua, and the Lord there is presumably the captain of the Lord of hosts, this figure that we have seen at the end of chapter 5. This is, this is a theophany. This is an appearance of God in human form. And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand and its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city. And he gives him these instructions. Joshua wants to know, are you with us or against us? And this commander, this theophany, this appearance of God says to him, stop trying to use me. Submit to me. I am not your co-pilot. And Joshua has to take the city, and Joshua's concern is, how is God going to fit into my purpose? But it's the wrong question. Joshua must ask himself this question, how am I going to fit into God's purpose? The real battle of Jericho was in Joshua's heart. Will the will of Joshua submit to the will of God? The second phase of this story is the account of the collapse of the walls of the city of Jericho, a classic siege 
of a walled city with gates closed, which presumably would have involved catapults and scaling ladders and fire arrows and other contemporary implements of war against a walled city. But instead, they are to walk around the city once in silence for six days. And then on the seventh day, with the Ark of the Covenant and with the priests of God, they're to walk around the city seven times. And when the trumpet is blown, the trumpet that signaled the year of Jubilee and of release from captivity, they were to shout with a great shout. And the walls of the city would come tumbling down. The battle is the Lord's. It's not Joshua's battle. It's not Israel's battle. God takes the weak and foolish and despised things of the world to confound the mighty. And then there's a third aspect of this story, the salvation of Rahab and her family. She is saved because she hid the spies, verse 25. Her hiding of the spies was the evidence of her faith and trust in Joshua's God. And because she believed, even in this policy of total annihilation, there was mercy. There was mercy on account of faith, faith in the living God. And then more pertinently for our question this morning, if God is good or since God is good. How can he command holy war? Because once those walls came down, they were to go into that city and they were to show, apart from Rahab and her family, they were to show no mercy. Women and men and children and babies and animals. They were all of them to be slain. Let's not uh, romanticize this story. Let's not glamorize this story. This story is about blood and disembowelment and decapitation with ancient, brutal, by our standards, implements of war. If God is good, or since God is good, how can He command the killing of little children? and babies. Now, the Pentateuch has set this up for us as a just act on God's part, as a, a righteous act on God's part. There's been a clue back in the narrative of Abraham. In Genesis 15, that Abraham was to be promised the land of Israel, but he would not possess so much as a square inch of it, because the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. 
the iniquity of the Amorites who dwelt in the land of Canaan was not yet full. And when presumably the iniquity of the Amorites is full, when ungodliness reaches a certain level, God would devote them to destruction. Joshua and his men would be the implements in that policy of harem, holy war, devoted to destruction. Now, let me talk about three things here. First of all, let me talk about the concept of harem, the concept of holy war. Secondly, I want to talk about the ethics of holy war. And then thirdly, I want us to look at the ethics as it specifically applies in the Old Testament. First of all, let me say something about the concept of, of holy war. I'm passing over Israel's defensive wars. I'm passing over the expansionist wars under the reign of David, for example. Samuel had warned that in asking for a king, a king would then want a standing army, not just a defensive army, but an army that would have something to do. And it would escalate war in Israel. I'm, I'm passing over all of that. I'm, I'm focusing exclusively now on holy war, employing holy here not in a moral or ethical sense so much, but in the sense of sequestration, in the sense that this war is set apart. Only God can declare harem, holy war. Every soldier, every warrior must consider himself consecrated to the Lord. There were certain things he was not allowed to do in the days prior to holy war. The term harem, devoted, banned, means that everything from human beings, from men and women and children and gold and silver and booty and plunder, all of it belonged to the Lord that He might do as He wills. And after the battle there would be songs. Exodus 15, the song of the sea, is, is a song reflecting the sense of joy in the holy battle of the Lord against the Egyptians. Psalm 98 is a, is a song sung as a consequence of holy war. And specifically in, in Deuteronomy 20, where you have the so-called manual of war, there's a, a clear distinction between cities that were outside the promised land and cities that were within the promised land. And cities within the promised land were to be shown no mercy. They were to be devoted to the Lord. You will remember in the story of Saul how Saul's kingship was brought to task by God because he had refused to devote not just the Amalekites, but their sheep to destruction. You remember Samuel's words, what is this bleating of sheep in my ears? That Saul had not fulfilled the policy of Cherem. You remember the consequence of the city of Ai, immediately after Jericho. The story of Achan, who saw the goodly Babylonish garment and the wedge of gold and the shekels of silver, and he saw and he coveted and he took and he hid. Those four verbs. 
and brought Israel to its knees. The consequence of one man refusing to exercise the policy of Haram brought Israel to its knees. We're talking here about the total annihilation, a holy jihad. Yes, a holy jihad against the cities of Canaan. Since God is good, how can He command holy war? Let's, let's dig a, li a little deeper. This is a difficult topic. I want, you to, I want you to feel how difficult it is. We can't afford here to give glib answers. Let's talk about the ethics of holy war, generally. And let me make some cautionary notes. First of all, our, our doctrine of inerrancy, our belief that all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation is the infallible, inerrant Word of God. What we have in Joshua 6 is not just description. This is what Joshua did. Just as David committed adultery, Joshua went in and slew men, women, and children. But what we have in Joshua 6 is not just description, it is prescription. Joshua did this because God commanded it. This wasn't a policy of Joshua's. This wasn't a policy of, of fledgling Israel, which had a sense of its own importance and its own election and justified, therefore, its actions in war against the Canaanites because they were the special people of God. No, it's, it's more than that. It's much more than that. This is what God commands. This is what Jesus commands. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, who, who blesses little children, who weeps because a friend has died. This is this is the policy of Jesus, of holy jihad, of complete annihilation, except on the basis of faith for Rahab and her family, complete annihilation and destruction. Let me make another cautionary word here. I, I cannot make I cannot, I dare not make the tendencies and predilections of the lunatic fringe to dictate how I understand these passages. I, I dare not go there. After 9-11, there were some leading evangelicals who suggested that the reason for 9-11 was the gay issue or abortion. And some went further than that and suggested that perhaps what we are seeing is an element of reverse jihad. This is, this is God exercising an extermination policy. One of my institution's former students is uh, this morning in prison 
I think here in the state of Florida, because he believed it was ethical to shoot and kill an abortionist and his friend. Taking perhaps this kind of law, this kind of ethic, and implementing it in the new covenant. Now, let me make a third cautionary word here. The question of how harem in the Old Testament, in the conquest of Canaan in particular, the question of how does that relate in the New Covenant is a legitimate question. Some, by advocating a, a Christian America, a, an America that is perhaps akin to Israel as a special nation, as a theocracy in which old covenant theocratic laws for Israel can be applied to the modern state. That's entirely wrong-headed. And I dismiss it absolutely. Now, begging the question of the exact position of Israel as a nation state today since 1947, 1948, some justify Israel's current wars against its Palestinian neighbors because it is the elect nation and therefore may exercise harem laws in the execution of its special elect status. I fully understand I'm treading on some toes here, but I reject that too. It is a legitimate application to spiritualize the harem laws of Israel and see in Ephesians 6 that we are to exercise the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith against God's enemies, understanding that in an entirely spiritual sense so that when Peter lops off the ear of Malchus, the high priest, Jesus rebukes him reminding him that the weapons of our warfare in a new covenant context are not carnal, but spiritual, mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The church has not fully learned that lesson. How is it ethical? This is the question. This is the question. How is it ethical within the context of the Old Testament? Harem laws do not apply to modern states, and they certainly don't apply to the church in the New Covenant. We may not take up a sword and engage in a crusade against whoever. There is a radical disjunction between harem laws as it applies to the Old Testament state of Israel and what may apply to the modern state and what may apply to the church in the New Covenant. My question is how is it ethical within the Old Testament, within the narrative of the conquest, within the great redemptive story of the gospel as it unfolds in the timeline of the Old Testament, how is it ethical for God 
Not, not for Joshua, not for Israel, but for God to command the entire execution, the ethnic cleansing. of Canaan, and that not to be genocide. If you don't think that's a tough question, you're not in the same world as me. That is a really tough question. Here's, here's the Bible answer. It's Genesis 15, 16. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Abraham had to exercise restraint because in the providence of God, in His common grace towards the Amorites, there must be a filling up of the iniquity of the Amorites before the wrath of God is poured out in deluge upon them. Calvin says on this sixth chapter of Joshua, God was pleased to purge the land of Canaan of the foul and loathsome defilements by which it had long been polluted. The indiscriminate and promiscuous slaughter, making no distinction of age or sex, but including alike women and children, the aged and the decrepit, might seem an inhuman massacre. but it had been executed by command of God. But as He in whose hands are life and death had justly doomed these nations to destruction, this puts an end to all discussion, adding that the decree, Calvin adds, the decree is dreadful indeed. Now, let me ask you a question. At the time of the conquest, the iniquity of the Amorites is full. Were they, were they any more sinful? than Southern California, or Florida, or Orlando? Do you think that you might find sins in Canaan that you could not find in modern America, or this city? Now, be very careful how you answer that question. Why was it fair then for God to exercise harem on the Canaanites when He evidently does not do so on us? A apart of the understanding of this tremendously difficult issue is we must grasp the heinousness of sin. If, if you have a light view of sin, if, if you have a tolerant view of sin, if you can look at sin and just walk away, if you can hear the name of Jesus blasphemed and it not cut you to the very core of your being, you're not going to understand this, that God is so holy 
that he cannot look upon sin. God is, God is so holy. Listen, he, he cannot simply will you to be saved. Just flick his fingers and will you to salvation. He has to send his own son, his only son. He only has one son. And in order to save the likes of you and me, he does not spare him. He, he spared Abraham's son. He spared him. But he did not spare his own son. Part of the reason we find this ethically difficult to understand is because we have such a low view of sin. L let, let, me, let me say to you, what's happening here in Joshua 6? What's, what's happening in these harem laws? It's a breaking in into the world of here and now, into this space-time continuum in which Joshua lived of the judgment that will be evidenced on the last day. This is call it what you will, an intrusion ethic, an, an eschatological intrusion ethic of the end into the now for a temporary period, for a special reason, because of God's desire to have Israel occupy the land of Canaan within the broad spectrum of the flow of redemptive history so that Jesus would be born and you and I would be saved in the integrity and righteousness of His holy character, because God is love, but He is also holy love. He is holy love, and He cannot, He cannot spare the ungodly. You see, difficult as this is, here's a bigger question. Here's a bigger question. Why does God, given, given the fact that millions of unborn children who bear the image of God, and among them Why does God not come and judge us? Not, not the oil spill in the Gulf. That's child's play. I don't mean to diminish it in any way, but that's, that's child's play. Why does God not open up the heavens and just consume this nation? Because, my friends, if He were to do so, he would be altogether just. And if you don't believe that, you don't believe in the God of Scripture. Because, listen, my friends, listen, there is coming a day when Jesus will come again on the clouds of heaven. And he will, he will separate, separate, having, having raised his 
his own to himself. He will separate one to his left and one to his right, and he will, he will say to hundreds of millions of people, and women, and children, depart from me. Depart from me into everlasting fire, into hell, into the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And my friends, what happened in Canaan will be nothing by comparison. Read Revelation 18 and the destruction of Babylon, the earthly city in all its pomp and show and arrogance. My friends, do you know what Heron tells us? That the love of God is a holy love and a righteous love. And it's what every single one of us deserves. And the only safe place in all the universe this morning is to be in Jesus Christ, to be in union with Jesus Christ, to own and acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior and prophet and priest and King. Because apart from Him, that destruction that you see in Jericho, it's just a proleptic glimpse of what awaits those who are outside of Jesus. What, a, what an enormous blessing it is that today is a day of grace, a day when we can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. Thank You for these difficult passages because they show us a little glimpse of who You really are, that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the Almighty God and not be covered by the blood of Jesus. We thank You, Lord, that in Christ our sins, though they are red like crimson, in Christ they are as white as snow. Now bless this time to us, write these solemn things upon our hearts, and give us a holy reverence and a biblical fear of You. For Jesus' sake, amen.